you ever had a teacher or an instructor or some kind of boss that you ever disagreed with? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I hear some laughter. <laughs> I mean, you heard what they said about how to do something or how uh, the project should go or how the teaching should be, and then out comes their, of their mouth something that just sounds illogical. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I mean, it just defies explanation of what you thought, thing, how things should go. So how do you handle a situation like that? I mean, typically, you might raise your hand if you're in a classroom or send an email or ask for a clarification, but most of us wouldn't just charge up in the middle of a classroom or in the middle of a, a, a meeting and just pull the leader aside and say, you know, you're wrong. <laughs> most of us, you know, if you're a student, that's not really good for your grade. And if you're a, uh, a, 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 a an employee, that's not really good for your longevity in the company, right? I mean, because most of us do have a semi understanding of authority, um, at least somewhat. Um, even if we don't really fully agree with what they're saying, um, we usually defer or, you know, we might complain to somebody else, but we don't usually charge up to somebody and tell them they're wrong. That's not what happens in our passage, as we'll see in a minute. We are up to chapter 8 of Mark, and this is the second of four lessons that we're talking specifically about discipleship and um, how we can be a disciple and how we be, can we become true followers of Jesus and not just giving lip service to our faith. So from last time, the disciples had uh, went on a boat ride and they talked about, all about the issue of bread and they finally come to an understanding that Jesus talked to about the yeast of the Pharisees. And that's where we left off last time. And so here we're going to take a look at what happens Next, so let's just jump right into verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. That just is, tells us that they're still in Jewish land. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? Now, this wasn't a question asking for information. He knows what uh, people are saying. But he's asking the question to lead them towards some understanding. And so they throw out some popular opinions. They say John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. And then he gets to the real question that he's after, and that is, but what about you? He asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter jumps up and wastes no time and announces very boldly, very confidently, and very rightly, you are the Christ. Now that's what uh, uh, all that Mark says that he said, but if we look at Matthew's version, we see that Peter did more than just identify him as the Christ. He says in verse 16 of chapter 16, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus goes on to say, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, by my Father in heaven. So he's saying that, hey, you've been rightly aligned with God. God revealed this to you. You're just right on the path. And so um, uh, he tells him that, you know, Jesus is not just the Christ, that, which means Messiah, but you are the divine Son of God. You are God in the flesh here. And uh, so uh, he then goes on to say uh, that he began to teach him more things. So he doesn't just stop there after he's identified that. He goes on to say that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now, let's look at a, a few of these words here that help us understand exactly what, what he was saying here. So that word must, at the end of the top line there, the Son of Man must suffer many things. That word in the Greek is deo, which means that which is needful or that which is Inevitable. Now, right here, in this moment, Peter does not get the, uh, what that really means, that it must happen. But later, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when he preaches at Pentecost, uh, in Acts chapter 2, he has this. He understands it, that the Holy Spirit has revealed it to him. In fact, he says in Acts 2.23, this man, Jesus, was handed to, over to you by God's set purpose and Foreknowledge, and that this means that the cross was no accident. It was not the result of angry people or plots and schemes or from Roman rule. This was not an accident. Uh, it was the purposeful, 
plan of God from the foundation of the world. It is the whole reason, the whole point that Jesus has come to earth. These things must happen. They are inevitable. It has been put into motion by God from the beginning of the world. And then he goes back and he says he must suffer many things. Now, why is that the emphasis? Um, Jesus was correcting their understanding and erasing the partial vision that they had about what Messiah was supposed to be like, what they've been taught, been taught all their lives about what Messiah was going to be. And that is mostly they were looking for a triumphant political leader who would free Israel from the rule of Rome and reestablish the throne of David. That's what they were looking for. And yes, that does happen, but it didn't happen then, and it also hasn't happened yet now. We are still waiting for the ultimate fulfillment when Jesus returns and does establish the kingly rule. But right now, Jesus says, no, we're going to suffer, be rejected, and there's humiliation and betrayal and suffering of all kinds that are going to happen between now and and the end of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And so that word for rejected is apodacomais. I practiced this at home. Apodacomaso <laughs> is rejected after close examination. That is to disqualify. So this kind of, of examination, uh, this rejection would not be passive rejection like maybe you had in high school, you know, when you didn't like those people over there, you just wouldn't talk to them, you walk past them, and then you just ignore them and give them the cold shoulder. That's not this kind of rejection. This kind of rejection is more like if you were examining a counterfeit dollar bill and you were looking at it really closely and you decided, yes, this is a fake. That's what that means there. And this is an allusion to the public an official examination that will take place at Jesus' mock trial coming up in just a little while, and that religious leaders are going to examine him, and they are going to determine in their own minds that he is a fake, we need to get rid of him, and he doesn't qualify as Messiah. And that's going to lead him to be cast aside and be killed, as it says at the end of that line there, be killed. But that's not where it stops, right? I mean, the best news that Jesus was telling them here and preparing them for is that that difficult part about suffering and death is he's giving them the glorious promise that that's not the end. That he, again, after three days, he's going to rise. But this hopeful promise, this good news that he's trying to tell them, the disciples don't get this. They are so befuddled by the thought of a suffering Messiah, they didn't hear any of that. And, and, the, and all they hear is death and rejection, and because look what happens. This is where we get the part about Peter. So Jesus is speaking plainly here. He's not talking pa parables anymore. He is speaking really plainly to them. And so Peter steps up in the middle of this conversation with his, his disciples, pulls him aside, and began to rebuke him. And now that word for rebuke is epitomeo, which means to admon admonish or forbid and to express strong disapproval or harsh criticism. So he stands, pulls up, pulls Jesus aside, tells him, don't talk like that. This is not going to happen. Now, this was done in sincerity. Peter's heart was to protect Jesus. He was trying to keep him from being uh, 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 thwarted by the, what he saw as these religious leaders who were against him. And he's like, this is not going to happen. I'm trying to protect you, Jesus. We're just, I'm not going to let this happen. We're not going to let this happen. That kind of idea. But G Peter doesn't have correct understanding. He couldn't re reconcile this idea of the suffering Messiah with the current mindset that Jews had about what Messiah would be. And so he's basically telling Jesus he's wrong. Hey, you're wrong. No, this is not going to happen. And uh, Jesus does not stand for this. So we see in verse 33, he says, he turned back, looked back at the disciples, and he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, goodness gracious, this is a sobering verse. We use it in jest way too much. But this is a sobering verse here. Now, because not one minute ago, what's Peter doing but proclaiming that Jesus is Messiah, right? He's saying, you're God in the flesh, right? And now, in his fervor 
in zeal, he's become an instrument to try to tempt Jesus off the path of God. Now, this should be a caution to us in our perception of things. We can have good motivations. We can be sincere in our feelings. We can think we're on right, on the right track, and be completely wrong in our certain and be still be certain about our rightness. And we're off the path because when we allow our sincerity and our feelings and how we think things should go to be used by the devil to try to thwart the plan of God. That's big thwart the plan of God. Also, the less big thwart the plan of God, like in individuals' lives, when we start telling them, no, you shouldn't do that. God would never tell you to do this. God would never tell you to do that. That's not what, how I feel about God when what Jesus would say. When we start saying stuff like that that doesn't align with the scripture, we're just like this. We're leading people away from what God would have them do. Now, why is that? Because we see what we want to see, right? We hear what we want to hear, right? And the world, including the church, is sewn down with this stuff today. We have to be really, really, really careful not to allow our preconceptions about what's going on to influence how we think or how we think it ought to go um, and, and, and step into and try to correct Jesus and tell him how it should go <laughs> and, and if we don't match up the way we believe with the book, right? That has always got to be the filter. And if you don't know, and somebody's telling you, and you don't know what God's saying to them, and you're just operating by your feelings, don't say anything. Start by praying. Maybe God is telling them to do something that doesn't make sense to you, but maybe it is the plan of God. So we need to stop, and we need to ask for the Holy Spirit before we just blurt out what we think somebody should or shouldn't do. Now, there's some obvious things, because it says specifically do or don't do this in Scripture, but if it's outside of those things, pray and ask before you speak up. So remember that the kingdom of God doesn't match our flesh, right? It doesn't. It is almost always opposite of our flesh. And, you know, if your God never conflicts with your opinions, mm -hmm. then you need to stop and evaluate which God you're following, right? Because God uh, will lead us is constantly having to move us off of our own desires and our own will, right? And he says, you know, sometimes we create a God in our own image and not the other way around. And so in this incident, Peter, it was going by what he'd always been taught, what he always believed. He was motivated by trying to protect Jesus, like I said. But Satan fueled those good intentions, but misguided intentions, to try to stop the remedy for the sin of the entire world. Let's just stop and think about that, right? We, and we never, ever need to think that we have the corner market on what God is trying to say. And God's plan, uh, it always needs to match the book, right? And then we have to work really hard to follow him. So Jesus goes on to say here to him, he said, You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. And here's the real point. See, Peter gave himself to the work of the devil in this moment because his mindset was wrong. wrong. He was concerned about comfort and about ease and about safety and about things he thought, the way things he thought they should go, and which are things that we're equally concerned with, right? I mean, that, that uh, is a check engine light there where we're concerned about only the way we see things. There's something wrong if we're too focused on the here and now. Um, so, you have to ask yourself, what concerns yourself the most? Things of the world? The things of God? You can kind of do a diagnostic on yourself by listening to your own prayers, right? What do they sound like? Do, are they more interested in mowing down obstacles in front of yourself and those that you love? Or about asking God to build truth into the lives of people through the difficulties that they are facing. How much do you pray for people that, or pray for yourself to be rooted and established and built up in the faith and to become lights for the kingdom of God? And how much do you talk about finding the right job, fixing that relationship, 
getting that house, becoming healthy and prosperous. Now, there is nothing wrong with asking for those things. The Bible says, ask for what you want, ask for your desires, but which, which gets the most attention? Which do you major on? Do we have in mind the things of God or the things of man? Read Apostle Paul's prayers in, in, in the New Testament. They don't talk about earthly stuff. They talk, talk about kingdom things, and that's what we should be most concerned about. So when somebody asks you to pray for them, add spiritual stuff to that. Not just the, the, the earthly stuff. Add those spiritual things. That they would know Jesus better. That they would be rooted and grounded. That they would know, be able to walk in concert with the Holy Spirit. All of those kinds of things. Add that to your prayers as well. And so um, this isn't just a warning for unbelievers or for Christians who never come to church or don't really are interested in following this is for the all-in body of Christ, all right? This is a warning for us because this is Peter. This is Peter, okay? This is not Judas or some random person out there. This is Peter who is tempted in this direction. He just said, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And now here he is being used by Satan. So we need to pay attention and be observant, be diligent. And so we are not deceived. And so after this encounter with Peter, uh, Jesus goes back to large group teaching. And this is where our, we start getting our instruction for discipleship that we're going to talk about. And the first thing to know before we jump into the actual points is the first thing he says is if anyone would come after me. So this first part here is a reminder that this is voluntary. If, if is what he says. It's a decision of the will to follow Jesus. He is not going to make you do it. He, I have plenty of believers who know Jesus as Savior, sit in church every Sunday, and they don't follow. They have no intention in following. They come to church, it makes them feel good, they feel a little spiritual, but they don't want to follow. They just sit. They have their minds on the things of the world and don't really give much thought to what uh, the God desires. So this is voluntary. It's not coercive. You get a decision in this. He's at, but after letting us know that it's our choice, he gives us three demands, a warning, and a promise. Okay, so three demands, a warning, and a promise. So let's go through these. First, he says, if anyone would come after me, he must first deny himself or deny yourself. If you want a single verse, then deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. That's, in a nutshell, what, what uh, discipleship is. So, this kind of deny yourself, the denial here, is not denying yourself of something. It's not like, hey, uh, I'm going to give up uh, fast food or I'm going to take a break from social media or whatever. This is not denying yourself like you hear about at Lent, right? A lot of times this is not that. <laughs> this, nothing wrong with any of those things. Probably be good for all of us if we did those things, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He is saying deny the self. Deny the self. And the word construction here means the phrase, this phrase means to forget oneself or to lose sight of one's interests. Okay? So it is the opposite of self affirmation and, and this focus on me, right? And when you, this, this inward turning, inward looking on yourself, it means submitting all our agendas, all our desires, all our ambitions to the feet of Jesus. This is 100% opposite of the culture that we live in right now. I mean, it tells you what? Just do you, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds good, but just do you. But let me tell you, as believers in Jesus, we are never to just do you. <laughs> we are to just do Jesus all the time, every time, at all times. Because what does just do you mean? That means think about me. That means focus on me, that major on my desires, major on my dreams, major on my in interests, major on what makes me happy to the exclusion of everybody else. I'm the most important one around here. <laughs> that is never what Jesus said. Never, ever, ever is that what we're, the mindset we're supposed to have. To actively deny yourself is to deny that me first thing that's all be built within us like we need instructions to do that. I mean, we like really naturally do that anyway, right? I mean, we gravitate toward me anyway. And so he wants, telling us to, to put that away. 
And as I was studying this lesson um, and, and writing this, it's something that I read in my journal a while ago came to mind, and that is withhold nothing for yourself. And I thought, you know what, that's a pretty good uh, way to think about this. Withhold nothing for yourself. And I thought, you know, uh, when we have arguments with others or we have allow ourselves to have stuff go on in the back of our head that's, that sounds like me, 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 what about me, what about mine, where are my rights, you know, why don't, you know, I'm always doing this for everybody else, but what about me? Whenever we have that going in our head or when you hear it come out of your mouth, the word me, then we are off track, right? Because we are to withhold nothing for ourselves, giving all in service to others for the kingdom of God, even if you get nothing in return in this life. That doesn't sound fair, right? But that's not what Jesus said. It's not about fair. It's about serving him. Because when we throw ourselves fully on Christ, we can then lean hard on him to provide what we need just the right time, whether it looks like what we want or not. So we hold nothing for yourself. So we have deny yourself. Then he comes back and he says, take up your cross. Now, death by crucifixion in Jesus' time was pretty commonplace. Uh, I read that uh, uh, somewhere that possibly 30,000 executions by crucifixion happened during Jesus' life here on earth in the 33 years that he lived. And uh, so the imagery about crucifixion and taking up your cross was vivid in the mind of the people who were listening to him. Because these executions were public and they were gruesome and they were torturous and now you uh, and the men assigned to this kind of death were not just any random uh, uh, criminal these were the hardened criminals these are the ones who were the insurrectionists against rome these are the ones who were unrepentant in the extreme now you've heard uh that uh, at, at easter time when you talk talk about the the passion week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, that he carried his own cross to the execution site, right? Well, this was not, he was, that was not unique to him. That's what they did with all of these guys. And the point is, is that it was forced submission to Roman, Roman's power, to Rome, Rome's power. It's like, so they would put this excruciatingly heavy cross piece on their shoulders, have them, after they've been scourged, have them walk to their execution site and they couldn't carry it it would force them to their knees and that was the image there because even the strongest criminal couldn't carry it and that was the point of doing that is like your last thing that you will do on this earth is bend your knee in submission to the power of Rome before you're executed that was the picture that was the point of it that we will force you to your knees whether you like it or not and so in this context, when Jesus says that, he is telling us as followers to voluntarily submit to the authority of God. Don't be forced to your knees. Now, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, no matter who it is. But right now, he's saying, you as believers, you as my followers, don't be forced. Bend your knee to God's authority right now, regardless of the cost. And this is the central requirement of discipleship. Jesus calls his followers to voluntarily set aside our rights, set aside this me first attitude, and give ourselves to him, setting aside our rights, our desires, all of that, and endure, be willing to even endure persecution, rejection, hardship, even martyrdom. Remember that all of his disciples faced this and willingly took martyrdom for the kingdom of God. So this is essentially self-sacrifice for God's kingdom. It's not a popular topic in church today. I mean, you're going to advertise a 10-part series on self-denial. I mean, probably nobody's going to come, right? By number 10, nobody's going to be there. But this command is what separates disciples from spectators, okay? You cannot bypass this call. So we have self-denial, we have cross-bearing, and then we have following. That is obedience. And so the word follow here in, 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 in this verse here means to take the same road as another. Uh, and that better understanding of how to translate that part of the verse would be let him follow with me. 
So this is not the idea of like follow the leader when we were kids and you follow right behind taking the steps. This is following along side by side with somebody else. And I really liked that when I was studying this because I like that seems more like a, a summons or a command and let more, I mean, less like a summons or a command and more like an invitation, right? Come walk with me. Come walk with me. Um, and it's probably what uh, Paul had in mind in Galatians chapter 5 when he said, when, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That is walk along with the Spirit, keeping the right cadence with Him. So now we can talk about what it means to love Jesus and list a whole lot of things, sing a lot of great songs, read books. But Jesus tells us in John chapter 14 what love for him looks like. Not complicated. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. That's what it means to follow Jesus, right? And so loving Jesus means obeying. Worshiping Jesus means obeying. Following Jesus means obeying. And so when we resist what he says, now it's those hard verses that we don't like about forgiving other people or being generous or loving our enemies or uh, giving up our rights, all that hard stuff that he says uh, that we kind of want to skim over the top of. But if we won't do those things, do we really love Jesus? Not according to what that says. Right? Are we really following or are we being like the crowds who came to Jesus to get healing or pardon? Or to see the spectacular and then went on their way and weren't disciples after all. So the only way that you do this and give up all of this stuff that he's asking for is that you are convinced who he is. And that is Christ, the Son of God. When we know he's God in the flesh, we, we acknowledge who he is, then we're, it's easier for us to obey. So those are the three demands. And now we come to a warning. Mark 8, 35 to 38. Now, the word for here introduces these verses as the explanation for why we're to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. That's because we need a perspective shift. I mean, it seems like Jesus is asking a lot there, right? I mean, like giving up my comforts, my interests, and uh, my desires, and my life. Um, and so, <laughs> he, uh, so we have to look at what he's saying here. Uh, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? And so he goes on there, and I want to give you an illustration that I, uh, with this rope right here, some of you probably wondering what the basket was for, but uh, this is from Francis Chan. It is not original to me, but it's a really good one, and so I'm going to adapt it to where we are in Mark because I thought it was a really uh, a good one. Now, so this is a big basket of rope right here, right? And it looks like, wow, that's a whole lot of rope. But imagine that this basket is sitting on a hole in the floor. And below this floor is a room that's the same size as this. Now, if you're watching online, don't know what kind of room we're in. This teaching space used to be a gymnasium, full basketball court. So you can imagine high school gym, tall ceilings. That's what this is. So imagine below this is a room just like this, and it is filled to the top with rope. Just like that. No more will go in. It's a whole room full of rope just like that. And then there's a hole in the floor of that. Below that is another room, same size, also filled with rope. And another one below that. And one more. And maybe even one more. So as far as we're concerned, that, that rope goes on forever, right? And so let's consider that this rope is the timeline. And it's not just any timeline. This is your timeline. Okay? And, and so this red part right here is your life here on earth. Okay? And uh, the rest of this is eternity. All right? It keeps going. Doesn't stop in the basket. Remember room after room after room after room. And, you know, for most of us, including us as believers, focus our attention on this red part right here, right? And we spend all of our time and our energy and our affections and our strength and our thoughts and our prayers in trying to make this red part right here the most comfortable and happy as we possibly can. And it's what we think about, it's what we plan for, 
has all of our affection and all of our energy. Ah, yeah, we know eternity's coming. Yeah, we know it's out there. We've read about it. But that's not really what I'm concerned too much about, right? I'm interested in this. Right there. And, uh, and uh, you know, where I can enjoy myself. And a lot of us, when we get older, we narrow down our focus to that much. And we call it retirement, right? And now <laughs> we're going to put all of our energy from this into making that part happy, right? We're going to make this much happy. And I'm going to you know, try to get all the enjoyment I can out of that much. And uh, all the time, we just ignore and ignore and ignore that. Because you know what? The Bible tells us that what we're doing during this red part right here not only determines where we spend eternity, but how we spend eternity as well. I mean, the Bible talks about rewards. The Bible talks about crowns. The Bible talks about our selfish motivations being wood, hay, stubble, and will be burned up. So what we do as believers during this red part, it matters. It matters a lot. It matters a lot. And what Jesus said, um, yeah, right there in verse 36 is, what is good for a man to gain the whole world to forfeit his soul? Forfeit all of eternity. Because he says here in this passage here, when viewed from this perspective of eternity, looking back at our lives right here, all the things we spend our time, all the things we spend our effort on, all the affections that we had are of minimal value. Not no value, but minimal value. I mean, and you see this in the world everywhere, and where you spend all your time, all your energy, trying to amass and amass and amass for 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years, and all that time, we give to the red part. And we don't think anything about what's coming, right? And so if we exchange this for all of that, it's not a good exchange. It is a terrible, terrible exchange, right? I mean, and so if you're not a believer, you're exchanging this for that much torment. And if you are a believer, don't lose the point of being here. It is not to get a mass comfort and ease and pleasure. It is to invest in following Jesus and invest in the kingdom of God now. And guess what? In the end, if you do that, you get everything your heart can ever imagine. Ever and ever and ever and ever. And um, so what eternity promises on this side, there just isn't any comparison mm. to that. So keep going backwards and step forward from the warning to the promise. All right, so uh, I have no idea why chapter uh, 9 here is not included in chapter 8. Okay, because clearly this is still more of the same teacher. He's still talking to the same people. Now, uh, but the likely reason is because the people and the group who decided how to divide up this chapter and verses in the 300 somewhere there, they saw a connection between the kingdom of God and coming with power as connected with what's coming next and that we'll talk about next week, which is the uh, transfiguration. And so they put it over there to try to make it go together. Now, a lot of commentators say the same thing. And, uh, and that's, they think that that's the best interpretation because this is a confusing passage, exactly what Jesus is talking about here. But to me, that's a little stre a bit of a stretch there uh, um, for Jesus to make such a dramatic uh, statement like, some of you are standing here and will not taste death before we see the kingdom of God come with power for something that's going to happen six days from now. That's what it says. The next verse says, six days later, this is what happened with the transfiguration because like the overwhelming majority of everybody he's talking to is still going to be alive, right? I mean, there might be somebody who had an accident or died of a heart attack, but the whole crowd is probably going to be here. So it seems like that doesn't fit to me. Now, 
a lot of some, uh, uh, so there's a lot of proponents of that idea, but I was like, yeah, didn't feel right. So I kind of come down on uh, a, 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 the idea that some other people say that this is a re reference to Christ's resurrection and ascension because that's the context of the discussion that back started back in verse 31. And I'm a real big contextualist, like you understand stuff by reading what's around it. So that's kind of where I landed because he's saying that some of the people in the crowd are going to be witnesses later on, a year or more from now, uh, to Christ's crucifixion, which is going to be transformed by God into the glorious triumph over sin and death. I mean, what's more dramatic than that? Nothing, right? I mean, it's like we can't come up with anything that, that, that is a bigger display of the kingdom of God coming with power, in, with power than that. The other option that I thought had merit was that Jesus was referring to the establishment of the church at Pentecost. And the idea here is that, that the kingdom of God came with power when the Holy Spirit came. Because uh, Acts chapter 1 says you will receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and then you'll be my witnesses, Judah, Judea, Samaria, and out of the outer words. I kind of still go with the resurrection and ascension part because it's more of a context, like I said, but the whole passage here is about defeating death and, and uh, triumphing over sin as being that glorious manifestation of God's power, and uh, we're going to talk about transfiguration next time, so you want to hear that, and that's a glimpse of the glory and the power of Christ that he has. But regardless of what your take is on, on, on that, on this, the point is that we have a promise from God, right? <laughs> that, that walking with Jesus and following him and being his disciple is not just a life of death and crosses and suffering. It also means a life of power and, glo and the glory of the kingdom of God. That is our promise as well. So Jesus started whole, this whole discourse with a reminder of the suffering and rejection and the pain that was coming. But what he said here, this verse, this last verse, uh, he says that's not the end of the story. Just like the disciples missed when, when he said it earlier, they didn't hear the three days I'm going to rise. Uh, but Jesus promises here that he will be vindicated by God by being raised from the dead. But but. That's part of our story as well. The hope, uh, whether it's, you know, you think it's the transfiguration, the resurrection, or the coming of uh, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, these are all reminders, vivid reminders that one day he will come at the end of all things uh, in the glory of God the Father and to wrap this whole thing all up. That's what I think this is a reminder of. And the, the point is to us tonight is that wherever you are in your story, whatever you've endured there, whatever suffering and pain and heartache that you have endured, if you are a believer in Jesus, it's not the end. It's not the end of your story. We have to move past this fixated gaze on right now. This is not all we have. Okay? It's just not the red part of the tape, okay? This is not all there is. That's the promise, and that's what we look forward to, that no matter, or no matter how good it is now, right? <laughs> it pales in comparison to what's coming and for how long it's going to last, right? So with the joy that you have here, just a little peek at what's coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have heartache and suffering, that comes to an end too. That's not where we're, the story ends. And eternity goes on and on and on and on and on. It just keeps going. Paul helped us with this refocus as we wrap up for tonight when he said, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is unseen, not on what is seen, sorry, but on what is unseen, okay? Since what is seen is temporary, but what is seen is eternal. The kingdom of God is coming with power. That's the promise, right? That's our sure promise. It's our eternal hope. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that if this isn't all there is, Oh my goodness, this isn't all there is. And so whatever we're facing now, God, we just look to you with expectation, with hope, with joy that you're going to set it all right one day. 
God, help us not focus on the here and now, but give everything that we have in this life to serving the function that we have as your followers. Oh, God, help us to see with new eyes, have new ears, to not hear the voice of the world, but hear the voice of the Holy Spirit within us, calling us to be faithful, no matter what happens. Because we know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's in your powerful name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.